So, yes, hello everyone. Uh, this is the BOF session on kernel sanitizers, and actually that's also followed by the BOF session on SysBot and SysCaller. So both of them are uh, this kernel sanitizers, and SysCaller and SysBot are closely related. So it may be that there's some discussion from bleeding over, but it's up to you, I think, uh, how, how, you, how you want to shape the discussion. So I think uh, in, I wanted to give a brief introduction on all the sanitizers, maybe to jumpstart your mind. But if you have questions right away, please uh, feel free to ask uh, whenever convenient. Uh, does the mic work? I don't, I, don't, I, I think, yeah, hello? Yeah, yeah, okay, uh, yeah, it works. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Maybe we should. I just yeah. didn't hear it. No, we just turn it louder. Okay. Uh, right, so I think I'll just, again, feel free to interrupt at any time, ask questions. This is what this is about. Um, but again, I will introduce all the kernel sanitizers that we have. And in fact, the last time that uh, I attended uh, Plumbers in person, this was in 2019, I think we only had uh, KA-san and some form of UB-san. Uh, since then, we have grown several other kernel sanitizers, in particular, KC-san and KM-san. So what are the sanitizers? Uh, so they're uh, ultimately, it's a, a form of dynamic analysis. And uh, what we're doing is we're analyzing a piece of code as it is being executed. Um, and dynamic analysis typically will point out um, system errors or failures. They, they will very rarely uh, be able to tell you what actually is the bug that caused the, the, the error uh, that is being reported. And the quality of the diagnostics or the reports that it's showing you is often also um, inversely correlated with the performance of a tool. And that's actually a big part of what the sanitizers are doing versus um, more bare bones mitigations is to a record state to be able to tell you uh, as much useful information as possible about what's going on in the system so you can actually debug and root cause the issue. And uh, one important thing to note is, yes, uh, with dynamic analysis, you're only analyzing uh, the state space that was covered during execution, and that's why it is so important and also very powerful to pair dynamic analysis uh, tools with a very good fuzzer or tests uh, to cover as much of the state space uh, that you're interested in as possible. And most of the uh, sanitizers work by instrumenting uh, the code that is being analyzed with the help of compiler. And then uh, there are various runtime components, all part of the kernel, uh, which essentially use these hooks inserted by the compiler to do all the analysis. Um, most of these sanitizers uh, are about finding undefined behavior. And, well, why, why is this, uh, where does this co problem come from in the beginning? I guess most of you probably know this, but C, um, as, we're, as, as, as designed, it was um, for fine grain control over very low level details. And uh, there was, it's, it's a trade off, right? In this case, the language uh, simply says that some well typed programs are undefined. Um, it's resulted in a simpler type system uh, with, with higher performance. Ultimately, safe languages with man manual memory management are uh, rather hard to design and implement, and I guess Rust is an example of that. And one of the most critical uh, kinds of undefined behavior uh, that uh, I guess we have are memory safety errors, and these are also the types of errors that uh, lead to a plethora of uh, vulnerabilities and ways that our systems can be exploited, especially if uh, these types of memory safety errors are in the kernel. And we have various types of memory safety errors. I'm sure that you're familiar with out-of-bounds accesses, where we access memory beyond the allocated memory. Uh, and this, again, may read random uh, data, corrupt other kernel state, and allows uh, potential attackers to control the kernel in unintended ways. Uh, 
the other kind of memory safety error that is rather critical are heaps use of the freeze. Uh, we're accessing recently unallocated heap memory. Uh, and again, we can read random data cor and, or corrupt the kernel state. Uh, similar, uh, if you have memory on the stack and you try and pass a pointer out uh, to somewhere else and then you deallocate the stack frame, again, this can corrupt uh, uh, the kernel state or read random data in various uh, unintended ways. And one of the tools that can help you with these is KASAN. Uh, KASAN helps you detect out of bounds accesses, keep use after freeze, and stack use after returns. And there are various uh, versions of uh, KASAN implemented over the years. So the default mode uh, is the generic mode, uh, which uses the default compiler instrumentation um, and uh, rather a heavyweight shadow memory uh, to maintain state of basically what's allocated, what's not allocated. Uh, this is only for debugging kernels. Uh, there is also a software tag-based mode which uses um, new features of CPUs, uh, in particular ARM uh, top byte ignore or uh, Intel LAM uh, or AMD UAI. Um, but again, the hardware for this isn't that widely deployed. So by default, KSN will use the generic mode. And then we have the, uh, the last variant, um, which is the hardware tag-based mode, um, which requires uh, a CPU with ARM64 memory tagging extensions. And this is, in fact, usable in production kernels. But again, the hardware for this is rather sparse. Um, if you do have a Pixel 8 or a Pixel 9 in future, then you, you, you can actually enable this. And uh, there's another dynamic analysis tool which, we, which we've developed, which is called uh, Kernel Electric Fence, uh, short KFence, uh, which can detect heap out of bounds and heap use after free accesses. It's a low overhead sampling based memory safety error detector, so it won't detect uh, bugs deterministically, uh, but it was designed for production kernels with low overhead to be deployed at scale. And if you deploy this across a very large fleet of machines, you will over time uh, cover enough code to find lots of bugs and I think uh, we've had great success with this also if you uh, do a Google search for bug KFence uh, you will find various bug trackers where people have reported KFence errors in the kernel over the last few years. Um, uses of uninitialized memory uh, also can lead to uh, reading uh, random data or uh, even old data from recycled memory, and this can also be used to um, exploit the kernel in various ways. Yes? Can uh, KFence be used with any of the other sanitizers in the same kernel? The same yes. So KFence is, in fact, uh, KFence is, in fact, designed to be paired with uh, any of the other sanitizers. Uh, the various uh, compiler-based kernel sanitizers are mutually exclusive, so you can't pair, for example, KASAN with KMSAN. Uh, but you can enable KFence with all the others. Um, right, and then, well, again, uh, users of uninitialized memory um, can also be used to leak sensitive data, uh, especially out of the kernel, if there is some secret data somewhere and uh, that data is ending up in a, a copy to user, you may actually end up leaking sensitive data. And uh, one tool that can help with that is uh, the kernel memory sanitizer, KMSAN, uh, which is fairly recent addition to the kernel. Uh, you can enable it with config KMSAN equals yes, and I think it requires a relatively recent version of Clang, right? It doesn't work with GCC yet. Alex. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So KMSAN, you need a relatively recent version of uh, Clang. Again, this is only for debugging and testing kernels because it allocates huge amounts of uh, shadow memory so to keep track of the state. Uh, uh, one thing to note is uh, if you are worried about uses of uninitialized uninit memory in production kernels, there is this uh, also it's a mitigation option config init stack all zero. Uh, which uses uh, recent compiler features to initialize all stack memory. 
uh, by default. Um, data races, so another class of bugs uh, that are, I think, a lot harder to understand versus the, I guess, uh, the memory safety errors are data races. And uh, the Linux kernel has its own memory model and that also defines when data races occur. I think I won't go into too much detail here, but if you have questions later, I am happy to also discuss that in more detail. But in, like, in short, uh, if you do have two concurrent conflicting accesses, uh, and they conflict if they access the same location, and at least uh, one is a write, and at least one is a plain uh, C access, then you have a data race. And um, this can lead to various, uh, well, unintended consequences as well, depending on what the compiler does with these accesses. And uh, it will also, so data races are also a symptom often of, for, for example, missing locking. Um, uh, and it, it can be one of the hardest uh, kinds of uh, errors to root cause. Um, but we do have a tool to help you uh, detect data races, which is the kernel concurrency sanitizer, KCSAN. Um, and you can enable that with config kcsan. Um, and it, the default config is relatively conservative, so there are a bunch of options to uh, reduce the number of data races to reported based on uh, idioms that have been uh, common in the past. But in, if, if you're rel paranoid about uh, concurrent code, then I do recommend enabling config kcsan strict. Uh, which enables more strict checking and can actually also find cases of uh, missing memory barriers. Uh, other types of undefined behavior. Um, so we do have the undefined behavior sanitizer. Uh, I think, I don't know if case is here. If you want to talk about this, then go ahead. Um, yeah, from, uh, this, this sanitizer is made up of a bunch of much smaller individual checks, whereas the others are uh, much wider and cover a, a lot more. So we have a couple that we can actually use in production for finding out-of-range out of range shifts uh, and bound array uh, index violations where they're out of bounds. Um, and then there's some more pedantic ones that we can't really turn on the kernel yet just because we haven't solved them all, but you can find them with those. Um, and uh, I, uh, under development is dealing with integer overflows in a way that is meaningful to the kernel. Uh, the existing um, sanitizer options um, are extremely strict. Uh, doesn't work well with the kernel. Um, and then there's uh, the, the behavior for trapping. Uh, if you emit only a warning and continue on with whatever undefined behavior was, was gonna happen, happens, continues. Or if you trap and just kill uh, that running thread. Um, I don't remember if I have another. Oh yeah, I cover each of these. So in, in normal case, you're gonna have a kernel image that's about 5% larger just from all of the instrumentation strings and everything else for giving a much more readable uh, warning uh, for, for when you trip over anything out of UBSAN. So for example, this is you know, array index out of range. The index was seven. It was for this type of an array that had you know only seven in it. Uh, if you run with trap, you don't have the change in image size, uh, and you get a very a really terse output which says, oh yeah, the class of problem was this. Go figure it out. Um, so, and the shift being out of bound, we're gonna catch negative shifts, and we're gonna catch uh, interference with the sign bit. Um, we've, like when I checked, we had like 110 of these fixes in the kernel um, over the last five years. Um, there's like almost, almost all of them because of syscaller, which is great. Um, and then UBSAN bounds, again, this is either finding a, a fixed array size index violation, um, or uh, more recently we can do uh, this counted by annotation, so we can actually do a runtime check um, of array indexes that have been specified at runtime. Um, so we've got about 93 fixes over five years. Um, this does depend on a lot of the refactoring work that we've done recently in the kernel to get uh, properly well-defined flexible arrays as opposed to all the stuff that have been used for decades to approximate it. Um, and then we should talk about semantics. 
Um, all right, so uh, I guess undefined behavior comes about because of uh, the language that we're using. And, uh, but of course, we do have way more bugs than just uh, undefined behavior uh, bugs. So uh, I guess if you write any piece of code and you make a logic error somewhere, then you still end up with a bug that and the, the, the system will not behave as intended. So uh, these are uh, called semantic uh, faults or semantic bugs. And these kinds of faults basically, well, they don't cause undefined behavior, but still result in system errors. Uh, you might even crash the system or uh, leak sensitive data as well. Um, and uh, the system will deviate from its intended behavior. Uh, the question is, who defines intended behavior? And I think this is uh, where it gets tricky. And I guess in the most rigorous cases, you might have a formal specification, but it's rarely the case. Uh, you might have a reference implementation, documentation, uh, or manuals. And in the worst case, it's not written down, but in the programmer's head. And that's uh, when we really have to, I guess that's when, uh, I guess we see some of the discussions on the kernel mailing list to flesh out what is actually the intended behavior. And this is much, much harder to detect. Uh, I guess in the most basic case, we do have tests uh, to, to check that the system behaves according to the intended uh, behavior. Uh, we have assertions, warn-ons, etc., uh, or we might employ a more defensive programming style to uh, avoid certain traps, for example, uh, missing uh, case statements, uh, and so on. And there are also some tooling that's coming up that can help with that, and the sanitizers, I guess, are part of this. So again, I will hand over to Pace. Yeah, this, <clears throat> this is a, a repeat of a slide I, I, I gave uh, earlier um, this week, but the I talked about the the sanitizers for integer overflow. We have a, a large collection of sanitizers looking at signed and unsigned integer overflow, as well as truncation. So where you have, you know, an integer might be being assigned to a U8, and if that value is larger than 255, <clears throat> you're going to get a truncation, which is like overflow, but is technically considered a truncation. Um, and the, the, the characteristic of overflow is that it's, that's a condition, and then how you react to it is uh, what happens on the other side. So with un, uh, unsigned types, you wrap around, and that's well-defined. That is not undefined behavior. And with signed types, uh, under normal circumstances, if you uh, overflow, that is considered undefined behavior, but the kernel has actually enabled uh, the the compiler flags to treat it as if it were an unsigned type. So basically, you get defined, you get well-defined behavior, but it also wraps around. Um, other things you could do on overflow are saturate, or trap, or do whatever. So this is effectively get the trap mode uh, for for those things. Yes. Is there some way to flag a given integer as wanting to behave one way or the other way? You should come to the integer overflow boff that already happened. Um, and 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 uh, and if you succeed at that, I want to know how. And uh, and yes, we have. Right. Um, there's a there's a lot of plan that has is still being fleshed out, trying to understand it. But yeah, yeah. Um, the the complications we have, of course, in this are a definitional one. Like it's not undefined behavior for signed, and it's not undefined behavior in the kernel. Uh, sorry, I said that wrong. It's not undefined behavior for unsigned types, and it's not undefined behavior for the kernel for signed types, but all of this is still collected under the undefined behavior sanitizer, which is strange because, as pointed out, it's, this is really a sort of a semantic problem. Um, in trying to fix this in the kernel, we've had a, a, a discussion with Linus where he was asking for the compiler to be omniscient, um, which we narrowed down to just trying to find situations where the compiler can, in fact, determine that you meant to overflow anyway. Um, so there's a bunch of these idioms that we're, we're able to detect and say, do not run the sanitizer for this, because the only possible situation is that you overflowed. So you can't instrument it, because that'll interrupt the intended code flow. Um, so there's still a lot of discussion on this. Um, and then for the kernel, we want to be able to filter either by type or by application. Like we can mark things as we expect these, this expression to 
wrap around or not wrap around, or we expect this type to wrap around or not wrap around. So there's a bunch of stuff happening here, but it's all, it's all driven ultimately by those sanitizers that are doing the overflow and, and, uh, and truncation. Uh, before I continue with this, any questions? microphone presumably some of those UB san things can be used with some of the other sanitizers or are they completely exclusive no, they, yeah. they work together okay. cool okay then I will continue also so I guess there are also concurrency bugs which are not data races and I will just uh, introduce this short example um, so let's assume we have a thread which uh, locks a spin lock. Uh, and then there is a nice comment here which says, careful, there should be no other writers to shared foo. Uh, readers are OK. Uh, and then it does a write once. And in this case, if there is um, another reader, uh, that is perfectly legal. So this is not a data race, because here it's using write once and read once, uh, which are marked accesses, and this is uh, the, according to the kernel memory model, not a data race. Um, but then you might have a third thread which does a concurrent write once uh, to this uh, shared foo variable, uh, and that is in fact a bug, but KCSAN would not tell you that this is a data race. Uh, and, well, this is a bug that uh, if, if you uh, don't have any other diagnostics, uh, it will just keep running. There are no errors reported. But um, KCSAN introduced um, assertions to essentially uh, say where you want concurrency and where you don't want concurrency. And it uses the, basically the, the, the race detection machinery that KCSAN already provides to help you uh, detect cases of concurrent accesses, which you did not intend to happen. And in this case, the comment can be turned into uh, an assert exclusive writer, shared foo, and it will then uh, be able to detect that there is a race if there is a concurrent writer and will create a report um, for you. And uh, there are various macros, so this assert exclusive family of macros, there's one, the assert exclusive writer, where, you, where it is allowed uh, to have concurrent readers but no concurrent writers. And then uh, another kind assert exclusive access uh, where, in fact, it is not allowed to have even concurrent writers uh, nor concurrent readers. And uh, during the initial, uh, I guess, implementation of this, um, there were some discussions around uh, bit flags as well, where it is actually allowed to uh, modify flags, but only a subset of bits of those flags. But And it became a bit complicated, so we introduced another uh, variant of this called assert exclusive bits, but I don't expect uh, that many uses of that at least initially. Um, and yes, so that's that if you have questions. Thank you, nice talk. Um, I have a question which is, relates to most sanitizers and user space and I guess kernel. Uh, you mentioned that it's based on compiler instrumentation, right? Like a lot of them, not all. Uh, and I guess you do manual uh, annotation of assembly code where a compiler does not have much visibility. Uh, uh, yes. And, so, and how about like third-party libraries that uh, either completely read in assembly or like users don't have source code for them? Uh, I'm sure if it's common in the kernel space, I guess maybe with some modules. In the video. Uh, I don't know. So in user space, this is, I think, more of a problem. And yes, there are cases where, for example, KMSAN, so uh, not KMSAN, but rather the user space version of KMSAN, which is memory sanitizer, uh, you have to have actually fully instrumented standard libraries, et cetera, otherwise you get lots of false positives. And this is a problem um, in user space in particular. But in the kernel, not so much, because we, can, we, we do uh, compile the whole kernel um, uh, with these sanitizers enabled. With modules, I think it's just not a supported use case to load a module which was compiled with different flags or compiler options or different configs and expect that to work. 
there were some discussions on the mailing list about this, but I think if you, if you compile a kernel module uh, with a different config, let's say, that doesn't have the, the, sanit the kernel sanitizer enabled and then try to load that into a kernel, which, which has a kernel sanitizer enabled, we don't really support that, and we do expect things to blow up at that point. So mm -hmm. that's... Uh -huh. uh, so, so about inline assembly, like kernel is full of inline yes. assembly, right? So inline assembly, we do try to handle that. Um, it's, it requ requires manual annotation. So this was actually something we, like, I think only got properly fixed maybe five-ish years ago. So the, for example, the, uh, a lot of the uh, atomics in the kernel use inline assembly. And um, back then, KASAN was actually not able to detect um, memory safety errors, which, had, uh, which involved atomics. And we went and actually we created wrappers and, and, and so on and uh, added the annotations so that if mm -hmm. there is an inline assembly atomic, but you have, say, a KA-SAN, KM-SAN, or KC-SAN kernel now, it will add the, the, the instrumentation. It just, it's a manually inserted instrumentation. Some of this is auto-generated. There are some complex scripts, like I think gen atomic scripts, et cetera, that help with some of this. So, mm -hmm. um, but it, yes, it, it required uh, a lot of manual uh, effort to, to get to this point. There, is pro yeah. there are pr probably still cases where we do not instrument inline assembly. We've had some cases where, for example, KFence detected a use of the free uh, in some inline assembly, which KSN wasn't able to detect. So there are still some cases left, but it's gotten a lot better. Okay. Uh, I guess my follow-up question is, like, there were memory tools before sanitizers, right? Uh, and one of the first ones, if not the first one, was like Purify that relied on reverse engineering with, I guess, all the drawbacks. It wasn't as fast, like sanitizers, because it uh, uses compiler, right? It can do way more efficient instrumentation. But for cases like assembly, I think like, the more scalable approach is maybe try reverse engineering. I, I wonder if like, anyone considered doing reverse engineering for assembly or inline assembly. And uh, it will come with a performance penalty, of course, compared to, let's say, annotation or uh, compiler instrumentation. But is it, is it still better than nothing? Oh, yeah. It depends on the semantic you want. So for KCSAN, one of the reasons you have to manually instrument the atomics and why we wrote those wrappers is that we need to say what the atomic is actually doing, whereas the, it can, well, you can't really reverse engineer that from the assembly without full knowledge of all of the instructions and what the high-level intent of that was from the compiler level. So for some things, yeah, if you just care about reads and writes, you could do that. Yeah. But for some of those sanitizers, it's not sufficient. So also, again, this depends right, if it's kernel space or user space we're talking about. So I think in, in kernel space, it's very hard. So the, the, uh, and I think, as Mark mentioned, right, so we have to retain some of the, the language level semantics for some of the tools, in particular, the data race detector, KCSAN. Uh, we did try to um, actually, this, like, when we started data race detect detection in the kernel, there is a completely different algorithm uh, based on thread sanitizer. Uh, I'm sure you may be familiar with the user space thread sanitizer. It uses a happens before race. It's a happens before race detector. Uh, we tried to port that to the kernel, but it just didn't work because we had to annotate so many synchronization primitives to get to the point where there are basically no false positives, and it didn't scale. So we came up with something else, which was KCSAN, but still we required the. Uh, still required a significant amount of like higher level language semantics that the tool is aware of to avoid false positives. And false positives really is what, I guess, makes or breaks a tool. If, if you, I guess, I don't know, on the kernel mailing list, occasionally we see reports from new tools, and if the false positive rate is too high, kernel maintainers will just reject it. Um, in user space, I think there are various tools which do dynamic binary instrumentation, which are still valuable. But in the kernel, I think the main problem will be false positives. So there are no active plans to... Not in the kernel, I think. Okay. Uh, thanks for your talk. So I have only used KSN and UbiSense so far. Uh, and I'm interested how does the sampling-based uh, uh, sanitizer work? So Right. Uh, so this would be, I guess, KFence that I mentioned. Um, so KFence, 
uh, so we had also after, I guess, a bunch of the, we uh, developed uh, the compiler base sanitizers, and then the question was, okay, how do you detect more bugs, right? And I guess one thing was, okay, we can see uh, from various crashes in production, et cetera, over the years that uh, bugs do escape into production. And one idea was, uh, can we build sanitizers which are so lightweight uh, that we can deploy them in production? And the idea of sampling came about. So, of course, it's a completely different algorithm. So what KASAN does um, just couldn't be ported as is into a sampling-based sanitizer that could somehow be deployed in production, but the algorithm is completely different. So in, in KFence's case, uh, this is actually, the, there was a version of this for user space first, and then we ported the idea to the kernel. It, uh, the way it does it is uh, it allocates whole pages, uh, and then it uh, samples uh, heap allocations and for a small fraction of heap allocations, in the case of the kernel, it's a sampling frequency based on time. By default, it's about every 100 milliseconds. It reroutes that into the KFence allocator, which picks a free object page, returns the pointer to that, and then around that object page are guard pages, which are unmapped, and if there's an out-of-bounds access, if uh, it would access one of the guard pages, it would page fault. We can generate a report from that. Uh, and after an object is freed, uh, the object page is again unmapped. And then if there's an access to it after it was freed, we get a page fault again and we can report an error. The devil is in the details. Actually, we did publish a paper on this earlier this year. Uh, if you're interested, it's called GWP ASAN. Um, it's uh, and it the, the 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 paper includes details about deployment in uh, user space on various platforms and also uh, the kernel, uh, the the experience we had with the kernel. In the KCSAN documentation, it says it can also detect some kinds of DMA memory corruption, and uh, yeah, that's the only mention of DMA in the whole document. So if that takes too long, we can, I can okay. ask you later. Oh, I think, okay, yeah. I know what you mean, yes. So basically, KCSAN, um, so the data race detector, the way it works is that um, if it sample, again, it, it, uh, for every instrument it access, it randomly decides to uh, watch an access uh, for potential races. Uh, but one thing it also does is it basically takes a snapshot of the memory location's value before a small uh, sleep, and then it refetches that value after the sleep and it compares it. So if there was a race, right? One, of course, if the if the racing access changed the value, then the value would have changed. And in the same way, so if there is, for example, a, a, a racing right to a memory location. Uh, that is instrumented in, say, that's running on the CPU, uh, then KCSAN would be able to detect that the value has actually changed. It will not be able to tell you where the racing access came from, um, so the diagnostics there is not optimal, but it will be able to tell you that here was a race. I don't know who the racing writer was. So explicit barriers or the MA sync and so on, they would uh, remove that. Yeah, they would say, yeah, okay, it's uh, from now on it's okay to change, and if it changes before you move ownership, then it's detected. Uh, Something like that. Not, I, I think maybe I don't quite understand, but the barriers would be would just have to. So if you do have a synchronization mechanism with your device, somehow. Uh, that ensures that the device doesn't race with the CPU accessing the same location, it would detect a, I guess it would detect the consequence of missing synchronization. But I think I had the same idea. So if we do a DMA from a device uh, and we use KASAN, we should actually poison the buffer that gets DMA from the device. Um, so that if there's an access to a buffer while it is owned by the device, we will trigger it because that's a bug. And also if, there's, if we expect to see data from the device, but the device doesn't actually write to it, it would be nice to notice when the, the buffer is still uninitialized. 
That's actually a great use case for KMSAN, and I think Alex has maybe implemented parts of that already. So I I'm not sure what the current state is. Yeah, so um, we we have a bunch of annotations for KMSAN where we um, actually know uh, that that the page is used for DMA um, data being being fetched from from the device or to the device. We cannot really um, detect every uh, like rewrite. So uh, if if say your device is constantly uh, putting more data onto onto the page, we uh, we won't um, detect subsequent updates of of that. Uh, we just mark the whole page as being initialized. In that case, we uh, we don't report bugs there. But if we uh, say uh, if if that's a, a page readable by DMA. Uh, we can uh, uh, we can report uninitialized data put into that page as being leaked to the device. So in that case, we may report an error. Uh, I think we, uh, right now we don't have enough uh, of those annotations in the kernel. So um, there is a call for, for for action. If anyone knows where to put uh, checks for data being sent to DMA, please add them. I think in the sync operations, we have the right semantics. We should also do it on the entire cache line. So if we sync part of a cache line for a device, that means that also the part that is not given to the device should also not be accessed by the CPU, and we should be able to just mark it all as poisoned in some form, that mm -hmm. any access to a cache line while being owned by the device is a bug. And I know we have a lot of those. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, so these are two kinds of problems. So what I was asking about KCSAN is to detect if DMA happens when it shouldn't happen, while the other one is if the CPU accesses the buffer while it's not owned by the CPU. And I actually implemented that last week, not for the kernel. Bearbox has also kernel address sanitizer. It's a bootloader, so uh, but it has the DMA API in a simplified form like in Linux, and it, it works, it works well. I poison it when I give it to the, uh, to the device, also aligned to cache lines, and I unpoison it when I get it back. And I have been meaning to see how much it will catch before I try to port it to the kernel. So it works, and I can even use it to detect duplicate uh, things that are unneeded, which has is nice for performance, so sometimes you map and then you have the same driver doing a sync into the same direction. It's unneeded, but if you check, ah, is it already poisoned? A second poison you can detect. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think it would be nice to have in the kernel, too. Um, <clears throat> and this call to action, it doesn't relate just to DMA. Uh, there are lots of such checks in other subsystems that can bear that. Also, say, USB and networking and block devices where some particular data should not be accessed by the kernel, or we need to check that it's initialized, for example, when it's you know, sent to USB uh, devices or network. And uh, the, the problem is that our team doesn't know all of those details about subsystem, and in particular details like that we should, say, extend the range to the cache line, because that's the guarantee in this case. So that's very welcome if you know some subsystem and you know where such checks can be added. So I think it, it all comes down to DMA in the end, to the, DM, to the streaming API. The interesting one is I think we should poison the, cache li the entire cache line before we send something to the de device, and we should unpoison only the parts uh, that we receive from a device. So if we have a case where part of a cache line is then read after another part of the cache line has been written by the device, that should be treated as uninitialized. And I don't think there's anything like that at the moment. I have one completely separate thing about, uh, so one, one of my pet peeves about all of the sanitizers is the extended stack usage, and we get a lot of warnings from that, and some of those are actual bugs. So if we have a production system with hardware ASAN, we would actually introduce security bugs um, where the stack overflows. Even if we double the stack size per task, there's a risk of having 
additional bugs. So I had some work that I put into uh, finding those more easily, where I have a patch to make the stack size per thread variable and then incrementally make it smaller during a test run. So if I run syscaller, I, I just remove a couple of bytes every, every few seconds and then see where it crashes first and then see what the actual greatest stack depth is because with VMAP stack, uh, you immediately trigger an oops and get a nice backtrace. Um, I hope that we can integrate so that at some point. you mean that when you mention uh, hardware, is that so the uh, software tags based version? The hardware tags. The hardware tags. So with hardware tags, there should be like there should be no additional stack usage. Oh, there is. Really, uh, Andre? Yeah. Just. I was just going to say it would be stack exhaustion, which would run into the VMAP, so no security vulnerability beyond denial of service. Yep. I think the stack usage you're seeing there will be due to, in the rare cases, it calls out of line functions, forcing more stack spills rather than because it's doing more work, right? Yes. So it's mostly from stack spills where it uses more registers because it does more things during the same code. But the, if it's the hardware tag-based version, there should be no compiler instrumentation added. Is it? Okay, maybe, yeah. Sorry, just to check, hardware tags with stack, so you can do tag stack, uh, no. empty stack tagging? So I think, in, I mean, in the kernel, we haven't added that yet. So there's no stack MTE yet in the yeah. kernel. Okay, so you're, you're on about the what's called hardware tags, but actually is software tags. Yes. It's the so software it's, tags. It's like this in-between thing. It's right? using hardware support for tagging a pointer, yeah. but it's actually using a software shadow for stack for yeah. tags, and that does introduce a whole, a whole bunch of things. Yes. So the, the software tags-based version still relies on compiler instrumentation, but it uses an additional hardware feature to tag the, the, the pointers. But that one, that version is also not supposed to be used in production. The one that is, supposed to be usable in production is the hardware tag-based version, which should not any compiler instrumentation, and if it does, it's a bug. So that also doesn't um, remove the aliases between stack slots, so if I have, no? Okay. No, it, should, it shouldn't add any, like there should be almost zero like changes in code gen. Okay. But anyway, I found, I found a few nice bugs where we have very deep call chains, okay. and uh, would be nice to integrate that in the kernel. I have, just haven't sent those patches. Cool. Uh, I think actually there might we have how much time do we have left? We have one minute left, and then we have to start the the next BUF <laughs> session. Um, yeah, uh, the assert exclusive exclusive writer macro. I would assume it uh, like developers would consider that more important than just a normal data race because they specifically added this annotation. Um, but there are very few uses of it, mostly yes. in the RCU subsystem. Yes. Uh, the, the question is, and I guess to everybody, like, are there any common APIs where we could add it to detect bugs more widely with it? For example, RCU assign pointer, would it be an appropriate place? Or maybe there are other similar ones where we can catch semantic bugs. Of, of Good question. So I wish Paul uh, was here, but he had yeah. to run to the next session. Um, but I know that, yes, Paul very much likes these uh, assertions, and he has added a few of them in the RCU subsystem, and I think has successfully found bugs with them, or actually while developing, uh, fi find bugs and then uh, be able to, d to develop a new feature in RCU more quickly. Um, so yes, the question is where else can we add them? And I think this is also like the other uh, annotations for the other sanitizers where you might poison or unpoison things. This requires uh, developer knowledge. Where are the right places to add some of these annotations to find more more bugs? Um, we, I think, yes, that's basically also a call call to action. If you have ideas, send us emails or patches or. And thank you. And I will, uh, I think now we have the Sysbot and Syscaller BOF.